everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it is my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. Decree with me, the powers of heaven are being shaken, and the church is rising to reign in life. Amen. <laughs> I've been talking for the last several episodes about the Lordship of Jesus and how important it is to decree kingdom and redemption truth into the atmosphere over our homes and our neighborhoods, our towns, and our actual country, wherever we may reside. It's important that we never allow ourselves to forget that the universe was created by words. All matter responds to words, and the kingdom of God his universe, everything he's created, it's governed by words. Now, we can choose not to believe that, but we cannot change the truth of it. So if you don't believe it, you just won't get to participate in it except on the negative side of it because, like it or not, you're going to say what you believe and speaking it out is going to cause it to become manifest in your life. But that's another discussion for another time. Today I want to read some verses out of Mark chapter 4 and remind you from Jesus' own teachings that this is how the kingdom works, is with words. Mark chapter 4, he had just told the parable of the sower and the disciples didn't get it, so they were asking him for wisdom and insight on it. And in verse 11, he said unto to them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So we're talking about the kingdom of God when we're talking about sowing word seeds. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? So every parable that is given, everything that Jesus used, it centers around the truth of this particular parable. We've got to understand the whole kingdom is built and grows and responds to words sown as seeds. He said, the sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. When they've heard, Satan comes immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on the stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Now, I know you've heard me speak and mention many times that persecution and affliction arise for the word's sake. Anytime you get a fresh revelation on the word of God, you don't are not supposed to draw up in knots waiting to be hit with something. You just got to know the enemy's going to retaliate. And it's not something for us to fear because God's already given us the authority over him. He's already given us victory over him. So we just plow right over him and keep going. Now, in this very same chapter of Luke chapter 4, uh, verse 35, the same day, is what it says. After Jesus has given them this revelation on the kingdom and how it functions according to words, the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. When they had sent away the multitudes, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. There arose a great storm of wind, and waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. Now connect the dots. He gave them revelation. He told them persecution and affliction arises for the word's sake. And here they are. He's given a commandment to go now to the other side, and all of a sudden they're hit with this great storm. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. Now remember, Jesus was Hebrew. This gospel was actually written in Greek, but he was Hebrew. He would have said, Shalom. And the wind ceased, and there was a great 
calm. So he used shalom peace as a means of dissolving the attack of that storm. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, I tell you, he was a Holy Spirit filled man. He laid down the glory of his godness while he was here in the earth and he operated as a spirit filled man. So that makes it possible for us to do the same things he did. And that's what he said in the Gospel of John. Now, chapter 5, the translators inserted chapter 5, but and when Mark was giving this account, he didn't just leave them there in the middle of the lake and let it go. Chapter 5, verse 1 said, they came over unto the other side of the sea. So it's still that same day after he, they've received this revelation on the word of God and the understanding that persecution is going to arise because of the giving of that word of God, because it threatens the enemy. They came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he had said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now, don't just read this and think of it as a Bible story. Put yourself in this and think about it. Meditate on it. Ask the Holy Spirit for revelation on this. This man that is being controlled by very many demons uh, had mind enough about him to recognize that his help was in Jesus and he runs to Jesus. But now these demons are not wanting to be forced to leave that area. Why? Because they are territorial spirits. Who do you think was responsible for whipping up that storm to try to prevent Jesus from getting over there to the country of the Gadarenes and setting that guy free? They understood from that revelation that Jesus gave to those disciples. And then when Jesus said, let's go over to the other side, the things were happening in the spirit realm that could not be seen with the natural physical eye. But there was some upset going on in the spirit realm because the angels of the Lord traveled with Jesus just as surely as they traveled with you. Well, these little fellows here were very unhappy about this situation. So they're asking, don't send us out of this area, okay? And there were, were that nine to the mountains, a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Now, I used to read that and wonder, Jesus, why did you give them permission to stay in that area? Why not go ahead and bind them up and send them to Babylon so that they would be bound in a, in a hole there, a prison there? And... Uh, the Lord made me understand that it wasn't time yet to shake the heavens and the earth and the overthrowing of the thrones of the kingdoms, the principalities, the powers, and all that kind of stuff. The work of the cross had to be done first. Holy Spirit had to come back and be given access into the earth. The stage had to be set for the fulfilling of the promise that the seed of Abraham would possess the gates of his enemies. Well, we become the seed of Abraham in Christ Jesus, and that becomes part of our heritage too. And this is achieved through anointed words that are spoken in agreement with the covenant of God in the blood of Jesus by the instruction of the Holy Spirit. So this is important that we understand this and that we learn to speak deliberately the things of the kingdom, the things of redemption, and that we love people enough 
to be speaking out daily over our areas, over our territory, things that will turn the angels loose to patrol the area and to help prevent the massive destruction that the enemy has in mind because he does nothing except steal and kill and destroy. Now, in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24, I'm going to show you this progression. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. So who's talking? The Redeemer. Well, who's he talking to? The Redeemed. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish. Now he's talking about the wise men as far as the world is concerned. And the diviners, people that, you know, prognosticate and forecast and tell fortunes and all that kind of stuff. He just turns it around backwards, messes it up, coming and going. It's fun to him. But he goes on in verse 26 and he says that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers. That saith to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah you shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof. What I want to focus on is the fact that he confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers. Confirmeth is from the Hebrew word kum, and it means to rise, to raise up, to confirm, to make good, perform establish. It's very difficult for him to establish the word of his servants or perform the word of his servants if his servants aren't saying anything. As the person once said, you cannot drive a parked car. The Holy Spirit was sent to be a helper for us, to work with us. And if we're not doing anything, we're not giving him anything to work with. So the way this process works is the redeemed speak the word, but the redeemer confirms the word. So when you decree that Jesus is Lord over your area, you're actually serving notice to those territorial demons that they have no jurisdiction. And now by greenies, you know they don't have jurisdiction. Now they will try to stir up storms to postpone the inevitable, to distract, to frighten, and cause you to back down because their prince has been judged. Now he's to be cast out. They get the same reward he gets. They get cast out too. They don't like that. They've tried for centuries to keep the church blind to that truth. But guess what? Lo and behold, the Heavenly Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is ripping the blinders off. He's waking the church up to who we are in Christ Jesus, and they're beginning to stand up and speak and operate as kings and priests to walk worthy of of the vocation with which they've been called. So don't be frightened into backing down and shutting up. Follow through. I would encourage you to speak shalom to the atmosphere over your area every day. Don't wait until there is a level five tornado barreling down the road towards you. Speak shalom to the atmosphere over your area every day because the force of righteousness works shalom. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what it says in Isaiah 32, 17. Righteousness works shalom. It, it puts the shalom to work. And shalom is all about restoration. It's all about tranquility. It's all about prosperity. It's all about wholeness, soundness, nothing missing, nothing broken. This is a blessing. It's a powerful blessing tied up in one word. And if you understand that and you're speaking that out, you are doing everybody around you a benefit just by being faithful to speak that word and release that into the atmosphere every day because today is the day of salvation. I would encourage you frequently give thanks over your area for specific kingdom covenant truths because when you get established in those truths and you get convinced of the truth of those truths, then when you declare that over your area, the devil is stripped. He's got no place to stand to work. Frequently give thanks over your area. The truth of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19 that says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. See, the reason that the devil tries so hard to get away with working destruction over an area is because of the sin in that area. 
And he gets the church to partner with him in that because the church is so focused on the strength of the sin in the area that that's all they're talking. Woe is us. People deserve what's happening because it's just so bad and it's getting worse. People are just sinning and sinning and sinning and it's like the cross never happened. But when he runs into that people that begins to find out about what redemption is actually accomplished and they begin to stand their ground and declare the lordship of Jesus and they begin to speak like the cross made a difference, well, it's a horse of a different color and it puts the brakes on his efforts. It dissolves what he is trying to accomplish and to do. So give thanks that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not imputing their trespasses unto them because the devil is a trial lawyer. And if God's not imputing their trespasses unto them, then he does not have a legal leg to stand on to accuse them. And therefore, he does not have a legal leg to stand on to work up something to destroy them. Declare this truth over your area frequently, daily if possible. Romans chapter 5 and verse 10 says that the people having been reconciled unto God by the death of his son shall much more be saved by his life. Well, Jesus said he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So be proclaiming that truth over your area and in, this, in the making the proclamation, you're releasing life to your area to combat the death that the enemy is trying to stir up. Decree over your area the truth of Romans chapter 5 and verse 20 that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, and you receive abundance of grace. See, everybody in your area doesn't know that grace can be received abundantly. But now you know, and you now have a responsibility to open your mouth and tell the Lord every day, Father, I thank you for abundance of grace. I thank you for the gift of righteousness in Christ Jesus. And you told us in Romans 5, 17, that when we we receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, we shall reign in life. And I want life to reign over my area. So I receive. If nobody else in the county receives, I receive. And I trust that you are so powerful and so good that in my receiving, you're going to turn it loose to begin to flow to all the people in this area over which I'm praying. You see? Oh, it's a powerful thing. Boldly declare often that as a priest of the Lord, you remit the sins of the people for one reason. And that's because God has, for Christ's sake, forgiven them. Ephesians 4.32. And when he's forgiven them, then you have the right as a king and a priest to refuse to hold them in your conscious thought against them. And that's what you're doing when you say, I remit the sins of the people. You are loosening it from your thinking. So that their sin is not bigger than the grace of God. So that what evil the enemy wants to bring against them to destroy them is not bigger than the salvation of God that he set in motion because of what Jesus did at the cross. Do you see? But the priests of the Lord have to speak these things out. Then, when you're faithful to do this, you know, throughout the day, throughout the weeks, then when storms arise... You can boldly and confidently stand your ground and command them to be dissolved because you've already declared the lordship of Jesus over your territory. Now, recently, just in this past week, uh, or at the end of last week, we had some pretty violent weather here in Alabama. And we had been praying about it for several days because, you know, they kept giving the forecast and saying it was going to be bad and da-da-da-da-da. You know how it is. And... The day of, I had been praying about it off and on all day, and I had been speaking shalom to the atmosphere, been declaring the grace truths that I had just shared with you. And I do this over my territory. Just every so often, I speak these things out over my territory and give thanks for the Lord to the Lord for these things. But as I was in prayer later in the evening, as these things were beginning to develop, and it was you know beginning to get a little bit wild, I, as I was praying, it just came rolling up out of me. Lift up, be diminished. Go over, because Jesus is our Passover. And I was inspired by the Holy Spirit to repeat that out kind of loudly seven times. So I did, and as I did, and I realized, oh, this is a Holy Spirit thing. I'm going to inform other people that I know are praying in this area and give them this ammunition too. So I get on my phone, and, you know, it took me nearly 30 minutes to text 30 different people and pass this along to them. 
Well, lo and behold, some of the people to whom I was <laughs> texting this were in locations where there were circulations already, and it was trying to, to, to touch down. They didn't, that all they heard were the sirens, you know, they were in the basement or, you know, underneath the building and just doing what they knew to do, but they were speaking these things out in agreement as I shared this with them. And I get word the next morning that somebody in that area, when they heard the sirens went off, instead of going and hiding like everybody else, they stepped out with a video camera and they videoed it. And they said the circulation was huge, that if it had touched down, it would have wiped this town off the map. And they could see in that camera the tails trying to touch down. They would try to form and try to touch down, but it was like they were being forced back up. They could never actually make contact with the earth. And when it finally got on the other side of that little town, then the thing dissolved. So I had no clue what was going on because it, it wasn't that bad right where I was. But the Holy Spirit spoke that through me. He prompted me to pass it along to other people. They started speaking in agreement. And lo and behold, he knew what was happening. And so it all happened in time for that thing to be forced to lift up and go over. Now, does God love us more than he loves you? Absolutely not. But it's not about his love for us, and it's not about the amount of power he's willing to distribute to us. We're destroyed for lack of knowledge. This is the reason yours truly gets on here and makes these things available to you. I'm trying to put the knowledge in your hands so you can stand your ground in your territory and so you can see things change and not have to just bow down and let the enemy walk right over the top of you and destroy everything around you. He has no lawful right. We have been redeemed and this earth is part of our inheritance in Christ Jesus and it's time that we stood up and said so because the scripture says let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm going to share one more thing with you and then I'm going to close. Back in February of 2014 I saw a vision of four palm trees and they were all on fire and they actually went looked like giant matches and so I said, well, Lord, what, what is this? And he said, I kindle a fire in his forest. And I knew he was talking about the enemy. He said, I kindle a fire in the midst of him. His worst fears are being manifest and there is no relief for him. Press on, my beloved, rejoice in me and watch me bring him to ashes. I said, Lord, why for? Is there something significant about that? He said, the prince of the power of the air has exercised influence in four physical realms, earth, fire, wind, water. He has used sorcery to manipulate. All that he has abused through witchcraft, I will restore as I make all things new. I am the head of all principality and power. You speak for me, and I will restore. Now, dear friend, I'm passing that word along to you. You speak for Jesus, and he will restore. Because whether we want to, you know, believe it or not, sitting on our nice little comfy church pews, there are people that practice elemental magic. And that's earth, fire, wind, water. They like to dabble with that stuff. They partner with demons to manipulate that stuff. And they, they're deceived. We have to forgive them and <clears throat> continue to declare kingdom truths. For many years, they've done their little deal and the church has just been quiet and, and except for fussing about how bad everything was getting. Well, we're pushing back. We're standing our ground. We're not going to let the enemy destroy this next generation. So we, this is the way we do it. We do not take up arms and physically get out and assault people. People are not the enemy. These principalities and powers, these dominions, these territorial spirits, those are what we're fighting against. That's what God has indignation against. That's what God wants overturned. And this is what he's training us and causing us to rise up and speak truth in love and declare kingdom truths and cooperate with him in overthrowing. Now, I could just go on and on and on. Let me bless you. <laughs> the Lord bless you and refresh you by his spirit. The Lord inspire you to take his covenant in your mouth and exercise godly dominion in your territory against all of the darkness that the enemy is trying to plant there. 
The Lord grant you dreams and visions to remind you that you are called and chosen for such a time as this. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now turn him loose and let him work. Let us pray. Woo <laughs> oh, glory to God. Father, I am so thankful to you for your goodness. I'm so thankful to you that there's absolutely nothing impossible with you. I am so thankful that you love us enough to keep trying to get truth through to us so that we no longer have to be manipulated by the wiles of the enemy. Thank you for your armor, Lord, so that we can stand in that armor of light. Thank you that more are with us than those that are with them, and we can go out our doors and be led forth with joy and peace and with complete confidence because you've already declared the end from the beginning. You have made us victorious in Christ, and we stand in that victory, and we boldly proclaim that Jesus is Lord, and the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord, and every unclean spirit that opposes the Lordship of Jesus is being diminished and brought down, and storms shall no longer put hearts of men in fear and hopelessness and despair. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you that you are making all things new, that the force of your righteousness is working shalom in this earth. And we praise you, Lord, that your throne is in the heavens and your kingdom rules over all. Unto you be all glory and dominion in Jesus' mighty name we decree it. Amen and amen. about to get wound up. <laughs> you have a great day, dear friend, and I will talk to you later. <laughs>